without any more on that, it's my pleasure today to introduce Elliot Soloway. Uh, today is the first day I've met Elliot, but I've heard stories of Elliot for a decade um, uh, from people who, who have run in the same circle. Decades. Well, decades, sure. <laughs> He's an Arthur Thurnau professor in the College of Engineering. He holds appointments both uh, in SI and, and in the um, School of Education. Uh, for the last 15 years, his research has been guided by a vision of mobile, handheld, and low-cost network devices are the only way to achieve a true kind of one-to-one -one parity among students in schools all across the globe. In 2001, the UMICH undergraduates selected him to receive the Golden Apple Award. Um, which is uh, quite an achievement as an outstanding teacher of the year. Um, so if you don't know about the Golden Apple Award, I didn't, uh, being relatively new to Michigan. I went and dug a little bit to understand it. It's a very interesting award. Uh, essentially, it's, it's, you can think of it as kind of best teacher of the year across the whole university. So it's quite a prestigious award and quite an interesting uh, uh, achievement. In 2004 and 11, the students of uh, Up in Eeks, Honor Society awarded Elliot the Distinguished Teacher of the Year Award. Elliot's also co-founder and CEO of Collaborify.it and uh, is in, interested in uh, entrepreneurship, spin-offs, and so forth around educational technology. So I know a lot of people who come to these talks are also interested in those, so uh, please feel free to uh, find ways to assault Elliot with your questions. <laughs> so, without any more, I'll uh, let Elliot talk on the benefits of mobile technologies for K-12, transformative and inevitable, enabling new pedagogical practices and dramatic increases in students. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, what we're going to do is, I'm going to talk a bit, and then we're going to a number of you have already joined uh, this collaborative session with our concept map, and we'll get there. Uh, so as I'll ask, no mischief yet, you know, just hold on to it. I'll talk a little bit about uh, education. My uh, parents came to this country, America, in 1946. My natural language isn't English. I learned English at school. And uh, it was an amazing experience, right, to go to school and to learn, and some adult actually took an interest in me. Like, like they liked me, and they took care of me, because I had no idea. You're a kid, you have no idea what the hell's going on. And every one of you, there's an experience with an adult who took care of you, who looked after you, who cared about you. And that's what education's about. And what we're seeing today, and I'll talk about, is all this technology, and I'm, I'm as guilty of it as the next, all this technology, but at the core is going to have to be an adult, and it's going to have to be a teacher, because that's what it's about, is somebody taking care of somebody else and helping them. And, but we need to reimagine what education is, and I've been focusing on K-12, because uh, higher education is so complicated and so difficult that I've decided to leave that alone. <laughs> It's just unbelievable. I don't go to faculty meetings because then I argue with my colleagues because they just think that talking louder is a better way to educate. Right. So, but how do you how do you think about education in the age of mobilism? The mobilism is, you know, everybody's got these little devices and what's going to happen. I remember the day I was at the Earl having dinner. A colleague of mine, Roy P., some of you may know him. Roy P. said, you see this Palm Pilot? Me macho computer guy said, eh, what's that? I literally stopped in the middle of a sentence and realized, oh my god, oh my god, I can program that thing. And literally the next day I stopped doing all this work with the computer, with the desk. The, 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 I said, oh, we're only building for Palm Pilots. And we just built all kinds of software and the, the rest is history. Because it, it really hit me that that is the way to go. This little device that fits in your hand, right? That's what it's about. So you all know Malala, right? And she just received the, the Peace Prize, which is really an astonishing feat for this young lady. And this idea that you've got to have education, that it's about education. The world needs education. And let's talk money for a second before Malala. There's a book by Golden Katz. They're two economists from Harvard. It's an amazingly thick book. It'll put you to sleep, I promise you. <laughs> I promise you. I've fallen asleep many a night. But if you, if you, if you just sort of step back from it, the United States became the world's richest nation thanks to its schools. There's a clear link, a clear link 
between the number of high school and college graduates in the society and economic growth. This is really clear. There, there's, there's no debate about it. And about two weeks ago, Edward Porter, Porter in the New York Times, simple equation, more education, more income. And in this particular period where there's a tremendous disparity in incomes, what is the implication? It's about education. And education is the way we need to do it. And you, you know, your guys are at the University of Michigan, but I see many people who are not Native Americans. To get here, you moved the mountain. You must have moved the mountain to get here. And you came here because you could get a really good education. Because you know that that's going to be the key for the rest of your life. And it is absolutely true. My parents, <laughs> you go to school, you got to go to school, you got to learn it. You know, and as a kid, what, what do you know? I mean, you know, I want to play, I want to have fun. School, school. They were right. They were right. And it's not just about money, right? This is John Dewey, and he's got a book that, again, is a, it's, it'll put you to sleep, but it's an amazing book. <laughs> democracy and Education. Democracy. It's, it's about democracy. And there's a recent ser uh, series on TV about FDR. It's a great quote from uh, uh, Roosevelt. Democracy cannot succeed unless those who express their choice are prepared to choose wisely. The real safeguard of democracy, therefore, is education. Now, you know all these things, but we need to remind ourselves on occasion that there's a reason for what we're doing. And that when we look at the technology, we look at schools, we have to have <coughs> this in mind. It is about money, it is about income, it is about a way of living. But it's also about the fact that we live, live in a democracy. And it is an amazing experiment. It's an experiment. And things go awry in democracies all the time. Right now, in America, it's going awry. It's a mess, and everybody knows it. But you know, that's part of what it's about. And how are we going to get through this mess? Right? How is America going to get through this mess without each other beating each other up or recruiting each other? Because that's the way you typically get through a mess, is that someone shoots somebody. No, that's not the way America does it. It's just not the way America does it. So, in this context then, let's look at education. Well, God, America's education is under attack. On the left is a cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine. A lot of people read it. And it says, your idea there. I mean, anybody's idea about education is the same as is the same? Anybody has a good idea about education? Hey, you, you got an idea, go do education. And that's what this is about. Like, well, we don't know what they're doing, but you know, anybody can say something about education. Because in fact, that's what's happening in America. Is that you're getting all kinds of opinions about education. As if teaching, as being an educator, isn't as a much a profession as being a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist. And this to me is very frightening because it's not true that your idea goes there. Again, New York Times. <coughs> and this is the Christensen Institute. And we know, we love Clayton Christensen for his wonderful ideas. And he's got a book, three inches thick, called Disrupt. Disrupt, the cl disrupt class. And it's talking about higher education. He's got a book also about lower education. And about how, A, the only way to do this, man, is technology. The costs. The costs. Because Clayton Christensen's all about beating inefficiencies out of the system. There's inefficiencies in the system. Get rid of them. There's no money. So let's beat them out of it. Okay? So now, whoops. If you look at this side, you know, friendly Venn diagram, you got kids, you got technology, and you got stuff to learn. And there's you know, two kinds of stuff. There's content, who's buried in Grant's tomb? When was the War of 1812? But these are content questions. And then there are skill questions. How do you work in a group? How do you learn, right? And what, what, the education system is all about is scaffolds. Talking to Stephanie a moment ago about scaffolds. How do you help the kids learn? And that little intersection is what we're, what we're trying to take the technology and help the kids. Okay, okay. 
The way traditional education works for the last 200 years is you got to master the content. In 1890, in 1898, 96, I always get the dates wrong. At, at Harvard, there was a group of men called the Committee of Ten, and they decided what you needed to know in order to go to Harvard. That Committee of Ten, their curriculum that they developed is still the curriculum in America today. The same curriculum. The great books, the geometry, the God, it's all the same. All to send kids to Harvard. Not most kids don't go to Harvard. Uh, but nonetheless, that's our curriculum. Just look it up. Committee of Ten. Okay. And so the focus is on content. Sit the kids down and make them learn stuff. And you, you guys are real good at it. You can memorize, memorize, memorize. I work in Singapore. I go there four or five times in school a year. And we'll talk a little bit about that. They know how to make kids learn. And they memorize, memorize, memorize. And so content is the focus. Now, here is the Christensen Institute. And here's a young lad. And I've highlighted an expression that says, the education program at the Christensen Institute examines K-12 and higher, edge, higher education issues through the lens of disruptive innovation. And the research aims to transform monolithic factory mode systems into student-centered designs. Who could disagree? This is wonderful. Watch. <laughs> this is a school in Arizona called the Carpe Diem Schools. You, the question is, this is the last question. What are the questions? How long a day during the day do those kids sit in those cubicles with headsets on? You know, if it's 15 minutes or 45 minutes, that's not a big deal. A half to three quarters of the day they sit in those cubicles. This is learning? This is getting rid of the factory system? <laughs> this is personalized education. And the term is, folks, personalized education. Why? Because after about 15, every 15 minutes, you take a test. And you get 10 items. And if you get 7 out of 10, you move to the next thing. That's what they do every day. Now, if you look carefully in the upper right, you can kind of see, I know, there, there, there's adults. This school has four teachers. One math teacher, one social science teacher, one science teacher, one English teacher. The cost of educating this, these children is about $2,500 a year. Normally, 85, 10,000. New Jersey has it like at 14. It's unbelievable what they're doing in New Jersey. But you know, okay, figure ten thousand dollars on average. They do it for twenty-five. Well, how can they do that? They just don't have any teachers. <laughs> There's no teachers. Eighty percent of the school budget goes for salaries, so they've only got about twenty percent left. But eighty percent of the school budget is to pay people. Get rid of them. Get rid of the inefficiencies. This is what the Clayton Christensen Institute says we're going to disrupt. Now, that's one picture. Look at this one. you got to love this one. Like, really? This is really what you want kids to do? Look how clean the desks are. They all have headsets on. Now, you notice that everybody has something different. Whoops. Because, in fact, it is personalized instruction. Personalized instruction. This is still all about education as telling. It's about stuff going from this mouth into your head. And whether you get it from a human who normally stands in the front, but now you got a computer, the computer is just telling you stuff. And this one you got to love too. These are, <laughs> these are kindergartners. My wife's a kindergarten teacher. And I show her this picture, she laughs. I mean, can you imagine getting these four kids to actually do this for 10 seconds straight? All four of them? <laughs> and if you can get them to sit there and hit a key, is this what you want five-year-olds to do? Look, if you have children, and you will have children, or some of you have children, would you do this to your child? And think that you're doing a good job? What has happened? We're absolutely nuts what's happening in America. And this is also going on in other countries. But in America, we're taking the lead. And, it, and under, the, under, under the, the heading of personalized education, another term is blended education. 
because blended being, well, there is a teacher somewhere. <laughs> but um, the majority of this is, is this. There's a school in Detroit called the Cornerstone School. And I look at their website, found some syntax errors in their description. I wrote them about that. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they use this, but a couple times a week. Okay, a couple times a week, that's terrible. I mean, a good lecture is good, right? It motivates, it gets a lot of information across. There's nothing wrong with lectures. If 90% of education is lectures, then there is something wrong. Because 90% should be uh, people doing stuff. That's what you call learning by doing. And you learn that at the dinner table. If you were lucky, if you were lucky, your parents taught you how to learn at the dinner table. Because at the dinner table, you'd say, you know, I want those pair of shoes. No, nope, can't have them. Mm -mm. Too much money. And then you started thinking, how can I convince them to buy my tennis shoes? And you started making an argument. Well, you know, nope, nope, that didn't work. Next day, try it again. And if you were lucky, your parents helped you learn. And the problem is in Ypsilanti, 80% of the kids come from single family homes, single parent homes. They don't have a dinner table where they can learn to argue. It's no good. They don't have books in their houses. I mean, I like technology and I read on, on these things. I mean, I do. I mean, I do. But you get books for the kids. They like the books. The paper, the pages. You know, they like books. Right? And they like their iPads. And I think it's great. Give them the iPads too. But this is, there's something wrong. So, I think you got to think about it in terms of skills. Now, when I say uh, there's lots of people who disagree with that other view, but I'm telling you what, in the next five years, what's going to happen in America is personalized instruction. There is too damn much money involved in this. And if you look at the companies underneath these systems, they're making a lot of money. Rupert Murdoch is the guy behind Amplify. And if you look at Amplify, the people in Amplify are very good people. Joe Klein and a whole bunch of people. Larry Berger, real good people. But the guy who paid for it is Rupert Murdoch. And he believes, he believes in his core, that what you do with kids, you sit them down and you tell them stuff. And they'll learn. And if they don't, it's their fault. And this is a, uh, um, from the labor statistics, from the government, the, our government. 65% of today's grade students will end up in jobs that don't exist today. So if you teach them what the, when the War of 1812 was, what good is that? You have to teach them skills, how to get along. All these soft skills. How do you do that? Well, in 2010, Kathy, my colleague, and I, we made a prediction. Within five years, 2015, every student in every grade in every school in the United States will be using a mobile learning device. One of these guys. Because it was so exciting in 2010. 2007, the iPhone came out. And you knew uh, the price was going to drop, you know, this and stuff. The Android had just come out. Oh my God, the Android. I mean, this, this is an easy prediction to make. 2015, done. <coughs> We're almost in 2015. What's the answer? Wrong again, wrong again. iPads. Schools are buying iPads at $400 a pop. iPad is not a mobile device. An iPad is a transportable device. For me, a mobile device is the following. A third grade, walking after school, walking home, school, from school. During the day, they were talking about root systems. The kid sees the root system, which is pretty outrageous, of a banyan tree. You know, a 200 year old banyan tree. Look at that root system. Out of the pocket comes the camera, the phone, excuse me, phone, takes the picture, and then that picture the next day in school becomes part of their report. Because the phone contains everything the kids are doing. That's mobility. Now, if you have a 10 inch iPad, it's going to be in the kid's backpack, inside a case. And more likely is it's going to be inside the school room in a cart. So I don't consider an iPad, a 10 inch screen iPad, to be a mobile device. Seven inches, you know, you might have to live with it. You might have to live with seven. Mm -hmm. right. Six, okay, we're going. Right. Mobility, it's all about, Heidegger talked about ready at hand. If you've got to go into your backpack, take it out, you know, stop, take your backpack off. Take the, you're not going to do it, you're not going to do it. But if it's in your pocket and it's ready at hand, boom, you take the picture. We're wrong. We're wrong about this one. Uh, 2020, it'll be okay by 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we work, at, as I said, in Singapore. And I'm looking at the time. We work in Singapore. 
They understand that what they have done to their children is wrong. They, they have no natural resources anymore. They understand that if they want their children to be entrepreneurial, imaginative, creative, they've got to change their pedagogical system. The way that it works now is teachers, some of you are from Singapore. Anybody? No? Okay. All right. The kid comes in, teacher stands in front, hands out a worksheet. Doesn't even let the kids look up the answers, lest there's some an incorrect answer gets in there. Teacher tells the kids the answers, they fill them in, and they memorize them. And they're very good at tests. This is not going to develop an entrepreneurial child. So with, with support from Qualcomm, they, they want to sell lots of stuff in, in Singapore so they give you money for education. And some colleagues, Chi Kit Louie and some folks, we work at a school called Nanshaw Primary School. Since 2008, we've been there. And before I show what we do there, let me show a quote from Dewey, because this is how education should proceed. Teachers give pupils something to do, not something to learn. And the doing is such a of such a nature as to demand thinking. Learning naturally results. <clears throat> Teachers don't teach. Teachers give you tasks to do. That's why graduate education in America is so good. You work with your professor who gives you tasks. And the professor watches, knows exactly what's going to happen. You're going to screw up on that one. It's OK. Screw it up. And then here's another one. I don't know exactly what you're going to do on that one. That's what learning is about. How do you get K-12 to do this? There are inefficiencies in the system. Teachers can't do this. And you actually hear, poor kids can't learn like this. You actually hear stuff like that. Oh, they need more structure. That's the way they'll talk. Oh, kids, the poor kids, they need more structure. They can't do this. Well, that is racism at its core. So here's a lesson about the plant cycle. And forget about the, the device on the right. What you're seeing are those rectangles. And that's the lesson that the teacher made up about uh, the plant cycle. And at the top, the teacher has written in a word processor the goals. for the, the, for the it's, it's like a four or five day lesson. You know, you got about 45 minutes per uh, period. So the kids are building a concept map. Kids are doing an animation that you should be animating. So they would draw how the plant grows and things like that using a little animation tool. There's the picture of the root system. There's the picture the kid took. There's a, on the right, there's a little spreadsheet, blah, 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 blah. That's a pocket PC, for God's sakes. It's 2008. We still don't have that today. In fact, in fact, iOS would prevent you from doing that. Because what the kids do is they'll click on a rectangle, it'll open up uh, an app, and then you do stuff, and then you come back. And kids love this, because everything is on one screen. The phone, the phone, three-inch screen with a stylus. Then they could blame one job. They were happy, because they could do their work on one device. Everything was on that one device. I think it's three and a half-inch screen. So I like big screens, because I have big fat fingers. But three and a half-inch screen with a stylus, it's not such a terrible thing. For them, to do their work. And these are third graders. They're like this, right? They're this high, mm. right? No problem. All this work. So uh, now it's ready to hand. Here's some, these are these are fourth graders. P4. They go to the zoo. We got Windows 8. God help us, because the rest of the world is a lot of Microsoft out there. So we've ported everything to eight. Oh my God. And um, collaboration. Elliot. Can I stop you there? Sure. Let's go back to the last, last slide. You showed us, no, no, not that one, the picture of the kids. Head down in the, this looks to me exactly yeah. like the ones that you were ridiculing. Absolutely. Slides ago. Absolutely. It's not done yet. It's a pro work in progress. They do worksheets too. They do. But what, what is so much better about the kids sitting here with the, with the phone in there than, than having the, the desktop screen? Because of this one? And because of this screen. Okay. I mean, you're right. It is a work in progress, and we go there, and when we see the kids doing these worksheets, and it breaks your heart. After all this work. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. But it's the lack of interactivity is really bad. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and those isolated desks like that, they don't talk to each other. But here you do. I mean, so, you know, they're, they're, 
they're, what's, in Singapore, they're frightened because they don't want to lose the test scores. Right? That's really important to them. Yes? But I would also add the materials, right? The, the picture of the banyan tree that you took on the way home is different from what the personalized learning system gives you. Right, so there's some attachment, there's some personal investment, and some relationship to their real life. Right, and that and, and that's one of the most powerful things of mobile devices is that after school you can see concrete examples of abstract ideas that becomes yours. It's my picture. It's my picture. I love this one. Okay, and there's another one. The teachers actually say teaching is fun now. They didn't like it in the worksheet model because. Anybody can teach anything. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. This actually, this is an, uh, she's an art teacher who became a science teacher because she worked with the kids. <coughs> and they talk and they have conversations. And there is tension. There is no question. The other picture that I saw, the saw that you saw that you commented, there's tension there. There's no question about it. Um, but uh, the data, the data says, number one, don't even look at that. The data says, Kids who are doing this kind of instruction perform the same on those, uh, what the MCQ, the multiple choice tests, as the kids who do the drill, which is good, thank God. But they do really much better on what they call the open-ended questions, where they have to write answers. And the teachers say they've never seen so many different answers to the same question. Because usually the kids have exactly the same answer, even on the open-ended questions, because they just memorized it. But now the kids are actually reasoning it through. And uh, now in Singapore, they actually have ha ma'ala, high achievers, medium achievers, low achievers. And when you walk into the room, you the, on the door, it says what you are. I know, I know. I know. They, got, they got problems there, right? You go to a room and you know you're a low achiever. It's hard, it's hard. But you know, uh, and we see what the role of technology is different with those kids. They love the technology. They like drawing more than writing. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. But and it's a wonderful opportunity. I have to go halfway around the world to find classes we work in. I can't even work in that hour. But that's another story. <laughs> what we're seeing is a cultural change in the school. The school is different now. And what we're starting to see, oops, we're starting to see is it's scaling. And now we're going to see some real disasters. We're moving to five and ten other schools, and teachers are coming in, and more money is being thrown at this thing. It's going to be hard to get this thing to work because scaling, well, well, just give them the curriculum. Just give them the technology. They'll, 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 no, no, no. It doesn't work that way. You have to embed yourself. You have to take time. Teachers have to talk to them, talk to each other. It's complicated to scale this thing. In fact, in education, the, the, the question, the only question is scaling. Because you can always change one school. Just go in there and put enough energy into it. You can change it. But how do you get it so that the other schools do it? Well, we're trying, we're learning, there are going to be a lot of mistakes, and I hope that Singapore has the, the political will to stick with it, because the, initially there are going to be problems. There's just no question there be problems. So now, next turn of the crank of technology. I mean, if you step back and you say, what, what's going to happen with, with mobiles and, and, and the, the next sort of technological supports? And the argument that we're going to make is that up to now, we've supported asynchronous collaboration. Web 2.0 is all about async collaboration. collaboration. Facebook, SMS, fa uh, uh, posting, Snapchat. Post something, get something. Post something, get something. But we all know that you got to work together. you got to work together. And Stephanie sitting here, the classic paper on collaboration, absolutely the best paper. And it's about how do you get people to talk to each other and work together when they're not co-located. That's the challenge. When they're co-located, it's hard enough, but how do you do it when they're not co-located? That's where the technology comes in. And, uh, you know, they talk, um, they talk about the four C's. This is the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, where they're trying to talk about, well, what's the next sort of generation of work? Collaboration, communication, critical thinking, creativity. You know, what are those... Collaboration, let's talk a little bit about it, about a shared understanding. So, I don't want to do this. Oh, we will make a prediction, though. Within two to four years, more like four years, every single mobile app and every single web page will be collaborified. It's going to happen. Why? Technology's there. we got bandwidth now. we got the tools now. Everything is going to be collaborified. You know, won't work alone. 
Oh, what do I mean by clarify made up the word? You know what I meant? It's that people will work together in the app. Not screen sharing. Screen sharing is one person's driving, everybody's watching. <laughs> everybody's a driver. If I make a, a node and you make a node, we do it simultaneously. This is going to happen. Technology can handle it. It's going to happen. So um, here is an example of a concept map program we map. And we built a whole bunch of tools. The Google Doc Editor is a classic example. They use a thing called operational transforms to make this thing work. Google has enough money, they can do it. It's really hard to do. It's great stuff. But can you do it a little simpler and a little more easily? Yes. That is perfect is what they did, but it's close enough. And so we've got a whole range of apps. And why don't we actually play with it now? Let's play with it. Let's see here. OK. On your right is an iOS simulator. On the left is an Android simulator. And it's a session that we've created. And I'll, I'll say, I'll ask in session. So there are 25 people who have joined the session. And there's all these people. You know, that they could be OK. And now, uh, someone already moved a node. Would somebody put Obama in there? I mean, who's tired of it? There you go. Someone, so you're moving things. Anybody can do it, right? And I got two windows open, and I can move. Oh, there's Obama. Okay. So that's what the kids do. They work together. They talk. They discuss. And it's very interesting to watch at the beginning of the semester. They don't know how to talk to each other. No, 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 no. A lot of shouting. A lot of frustration. But then they learn. They learn how to talk to each other. We're working at uh, St. Francis Catholic School in seventh and eighth grade. Sister Rebecca, wonderful, wonderful lady, lots of patience. And what we do is we do we do all these apps. Everything's collaborified. Okay. Um, and, and you can see these are cross-platform. And now we're going into eight, uh, HTML5. Uh, now it's just it's everywhere. It doesn't really matter what device it is. They're really device agnostic. HTML5 is strong enough to handle all this. And this is about uh, thank you for not to. Some of the boys would just delete all the notes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, you can do that, right? You can do that. And the way this works, it's critically important that when you're not co-located, that you can talk to each other verbally. And so the, uh, the technology, well, you could use uh, the Google Hangouts, you could use the Skype, you could use whatever, you use the phone. But it's critically important that people are talking to each other. We have an app we call Yes We Can so that when you're watching a Khan Academy video together, you could be talking about the video and writing. And you take your screen, you cut it in half, the video's on one side, your word processor or your drawing tool is on the other side, and you're talking. They made me take it down because I had yes me K-H-A-N. <laughs> so what did I do? K-A-H-N. <laughs> so I put it back up. Um, why not? Why not? And the whole point is you don't have to learn alone again. You don't have to learn alone again. All this class flipping. Well, we'll make a little video class and the kids will watch it at home. And then we'll do problem solving during the, during the, the day. It's not a bad idea except the kids don't watch it at home. And when they watch it at home, they get stuck. Oh, you can watch the video 17 times until you get it right. There is plenty of data in the early days of reading that if the kids read the same passage over and over and over again, they ain't going to get much better. You now need to teach strategies about summarization, about paraphrasing. Then you can start to get out of multiple viewings of the same materials. But just watching it a few more times, is that going to make a difference? Well, working together again can help. So uh, I will leave this up there, and I'll go back to this. Okay, I don't want to talk about that. Um, uh, seventh grade, and what they're doing, co-located, um, is out of the side of their mouth, you can't see this, if it was a video, they're asking, they're talking to each other. And they're making a concept map, and they're outlining the chapter. Maybe not the most imaginative use, but it's wonderful. They're still talking to each other. They're, they're making an arguments about why this should be this way, why that should be that way. Again, look at the boys. There's a little difference there. The girls are much more engaged. That's why I, I mean, I, for me, the gender is everything, right, for these kids. 
So um, this is first grade. <laughs> These are first graders. And this is in Plymouth Canton. And why? Plymouth Canton just passed a bond issue for $140 million. They're going to pay for $140 million for the next 20 years, and they're going to buy iPads for all the kids. That's what they're going to do. Every kid's going to get an iPad. What are you going to do with them? <laughs> you ask the teachers. The te actually, the teachers ask me, do you know what apps are coming on them when we get them? The teacher asks me the week before school, what apps are coming on this device? Holy Toledo. I mean, really? 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 They, 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 but we're buying them iPads. This is America. So these are the first page. And, and what's, what's interesting about, uh, about the collaboration is when they have a disagreement, they do rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, these are first graders. <laughs> At least one isn't hitting the other one over the head. They're, they're, they're doing rock, paper, scissors. Um, I'm working with uh, Dr. Anne Marie Palansar and some graduate students, School of Ed, and a program called We Investigate. And that really is you take your seven inch screen, hold it landscape, cut it in half. Now you've got two windows. And uh, on the left would be, let's say, a simulation. This could be a video. This could be anything. I mean, these are two different windows. And the kids are in this, because they're really close together. And this particular pair is talking. And I want to show a little clip. Uh, yeah, the, the data works. Okay. This, uh, this is an interesting clip that one of the young ladies drew that, on this screen here, she drew that black line at the top. Okay, and so here, and she, here's the wave, and then the other young girl said, well, what's that? And then one said, well, it's a wave so that you know it's water. Okay, and oh, I'm not so sure about that. In fact, it was bromine, and she knew that bromine and water have that same kind of viscosity, and that, that the bromine would act like water, and so they, they, it wouldn't fill the whole container. And what was interesting was that Elaine... Rose drew it, and as she was drawing it, Elaine saw it. So the, the, the simultaneity, almost the analog nature of that drawing was really important. It's not like you write, you draw, and then someone sees something. No, as you're drawing it, you see it. So they have a conversation now. This goes on for a couple of pages. I'll just, towards the end. Um, we can erase it. No, I'll do No, let's draw it again. And, the, and then, you know, at the end, she says, liquid doesn't fill the container. Thanks, Elaine. That was such a perfect way. There's been a whole set of discussions, again, that I didn't show you, where they've talked about that line and how this should go. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. That's what the collaboration can do. Now, they're sitting there huddled together. I mean, I don't know if you could do this over the phone. I don't know if that could happen. But certainly, together, this was really important. And then there again. And what we find is three things the kids can do that the, the, the collaboration helps them with. One, it helps them clarify their peers' ideas. Another is it clarifies their own ideas, and then they feed off each other. One says one thing, one says another. Just what you all experience when you work with somebody. It's you feeding off each other's ideas. That's what where the powerfulness comes from this. So we have a, a software development kit. Um, uh, if you go there, you can get free, free, free software development kit that you can take your app or your web page and collaborate it so that more people can join it right there. Whether it's an app or whether it's a web app in the browser, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what this company is trying to do is social shopping, selling people stuff. That's where the money is. Oh well, oh well, oh well. But I'm working in education trying to get the companies to say, oh, now we can collaborify our, our dozens and dozens and millions of web pages that we have where kids do things. Now the kids can work together. What an idea. So we're doing that. And again, this idea of normally kids are solitary when they work at home. Now you can work together, right? So yes, we can't. So. Do that. <laughs> um, we also have an app called Cooties. And Cooties, again, is, is participatory, participatory simulation. All the kids in the class join. And now they start meeting each other. 
One takes the iPad and they meet each other. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, and then they send messages to each other using low, low power Bluetooth to make sure that that's the one that's together and that's why you count to five. And you get, you, the kids learn about how infectious diseases happen. You have the disease, uh, student meets, and these are, again, these are first graders playing cooties. And I don't know exactly what they're getting out of it, but they do understand at the end that they can get sick, be made sick from someone that they've never met. That, 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 that somebody meets somebody and they get sick, and then they meet me, and they made me sick. But it's really not their fault, it was this first person who really did it. Right? They get the idea of transmission. And now, um, you know, this is all this stuff again. And um, I've been talking to teachers, and they're telling me that, kid, that they don't think the kids have, the seventh graders have the maturity to really deal with Ebola. And it'd be too frightening. And it just, it's just too much fear going on, which is exactly what education is all about. So with that, I'll stop. We have 10 minutes or so for questions and comments. Comments, comments, uh, conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions, comments, thoughts. Yes, ma'am. Say it again, sorry. Can we use Google Glass, things like this, to visualize the application? Google Glass? Yes. Can't see why not. Right now, no, but I can't see in principle why not. We couldn't take whatever, however they do it and collaborate whatever's on there. So that, in other words, you have it and you have it and you have it. And we're, we're sharing as we're walking, for example. Mm -hmm. That'd be very cool. <laughs> oh, I like that idea. Hmm, okay, yes? Elliot, you showed us this picture of these students in these tiny little room closet like cubicles. And you said, well, 10, 15 minutes, maybe that's okay. And then, and then you talked about public lecture and said, who doesn't like a, a, a good public lecture? Yeah. Like we just heard, that's okay too, uh, as long as it's not 90%. And so I'm wondering with collaboration, how much should be collaborative? How much collaborate? Like, should we be yeah, yeah. beating the introversion out of our children, or um, <laughs> it, how how much do you think? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Because the teachers, when I show them the stuff, they say, "Wow, well, you know, I want these kids to work by themselves for a while, agency, before they work together." And that's a good point. And they they develop techniques. They'll work by themselves for a while, then they'll agree on which one to go forward with. So yes, there's a there's a uh, a combination. You, Total collaboration, kids need to work by themselves. And the teachers are always asking us, who did what? And we actually have those data. So we can say that you know this third person was just sitting there not really contributing very much at all. So yes, it's, it, I might have painted a picture that, oh, collaboration all the time, everywhere. No, no, that's not reasonable. There has to be some sort of, uh, uh, some, uh, something, sharing. Absolutely, absolutely. Are there any inefficiencies in the system that you think can be solved by technology without reverting to that system? I th yeah, absolutely. I think the, the inefficiencies of the kids not really being able to experience the relationship between what goes on outside the school with what goes on inside the school. Right? When they leave school, not, when most kids leave school, has, what goes on out there has nothing to do here. I mean, there, there's the expression, you know, anytime, anywhere learning. Right? I don't like that one. I like all the time, everywhere learning, right? If there's something different about that expression, and that's what kids are doing, all the time, everywhere learning. And so the technology can facilitate all the time, everywhere learning. That's what, it, is it an inefficiency? It's an inefficiency in the sense that the kids don't have the opportunities in class. So yes, I think that's one inefficiency. I think the, another inefficiency with helping teachers work together. They have to work together. And right now, they close the door, and that's it. And no, no, they've got to work together. They've got to share curriculum. They've got to share observations. They've got to be much more collegial. But the school isn't set up to do that. It's not set up. Technology can help them. So I think there's a lot of stuff they can do. Uh, video, uh, you know, uh, people are doing a lot of video of classrooms, showing teachers performances of class. I think that's really very powerful. Very, very powerful. Oh, I did that? There was a missed opportunity there. <coughs> oh, okay. So I think that, yes, you can do that. But if you think about inefficiencies as the way this is, 
I don't think that's the right way to think you about it. in terms it. of cost? It's like yeah. You're going to save money. You're going to save money. Yeah, you can save money. You, you can. But in the end, is this going to get the America what it wants? I don't think so. I don't think so. Sorry for the other oh, hello. Hi. I was wondering, are there differences that you see with the classrooms that you run um, with Collaborify in Singapore versus the ones that you run here? And what are they? We, we are about to introduce the Collaborify software into Singapore next in January. So we haven't experienced it yet. Mm -hmm. It will be interesting, though. You're right. Because the, the, the social culture of how their world works you don't say somebody's wrong, right? I mean, that's what you're getting at. Is they're it, different. They're different. Just wondering how you're right. It will be interesting to see. How do those kids work together with the collaboration as opposed to how the U.S. kids do it? Good question. I don't know. We'll see. We will see. Because the, the culture, right, is a very different culture. It's much more getting along. Yes? Uh, you talked more about the celebrity, like how to you What, what we've done, uh, we, what we've done, and Nan Chow is um, we brought five, there's five schools that are going to do it. So they brought the five, they brought ten teachers, from two teachers from each school, to basically shadow the teachers in Nan Chow for a whole year. And they meet every two weeks with these two teachers, from, so it's now ten teachers, right, from the five schools, to, to meet with them to talk to them. And then they have the teachers from those schools change the curriculum. Whatever is in their child is in their child. It's just what, the way they do it. But different schools have different cultures, different, ex different kinds of students. So they have to localize the curriculum. All that energy went into it. And still, still there are, there's, there's troubles. The, the, the principal in one school is not supportive of this whole enterprise. And if the principal says, this, when you hit a bump, you don't have to do it, you're finished. If the principal says, I know there's going to be bumps. I got it. And we'll get through the bumps. It makes a huge difference. And um, another thing that we saw for the scaling was, in science, we work with some researchers at the National Institute of Education, Dr. Chi Kit Lu and his friends. In the English department, we don't have the researchers. And what we're finding is that the researchers tend to push the teachers to really go further, to think a little deeper. But without the researchers in the English department, the English teachers are much more floundering. So we're seeing the science teachers being really, really developed because they're involved with researchers. Now, when I went into this, I didn't, I didn't understand the role that researchers can play in a functioning school. But it seems absolutely crystal clear that researchers need to be involved with the with the, uh, the teachers, helping the teachers move ahead and studying what happens. And the data isn't so important. It, 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 that's not what the teachers need. It's, it's the conversations that the researchers have with the teachers that makes the difference. I just want to push on that a little bit, Elliot, because um, those of you who went to convocation, right? And heard our dean speak, and he said, "Question causal relationships." I want to question that causal relationship because often teachers are allowed to or invited into classrooms with teachers who are already just amazingly great teachers. So, uh, because I'd be careful about the causality there, because I, I have a beef with a lot of what we do in the learning sciences, as I call, steady artisanal teaching. Mm -hmm. Oh, right? absolutely. We build, we build curriculum for artisanal teaching, and that's why it doesn't scale. That's right. But it's okay. not because I'm in the room with that teacher. It's because... That teacher is amazing. Yes, absolutely. And an artisan teacher is, is a thing to behold. But, you know, you don't... Uh, if you got 30 teachers, there's gonna be, some of them are going to be artisan. But most of them are just going right. to be... So we have to figure out how to help those teachers, and not because we're there, but we'll how to... Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not the. What I found, I've started several companies. And the first company, well, the fourth company, was a company called Go No. And Go No took all the Pond software and all this great stuff 
and we went from school to school, and we found artists and teachers the first year, and they made they did such great things with the palms. It was just so wonderful. Then the, 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 the principal said, okay, let's scale this to the next one. Every single one failed. Why? There's no curriculum. The artists and teachers could make it up. They could just they just made it up. But you know, just when folks what you, uh, give me the curriculum, tell me what I'm supposed to do. The data suggests, I'll ask you a question. Is it more important to have a good teacher or good curriculum? Your instinct is going to tell you, teacher. The data says no. Data says a good curriculum will raise all the boats. So a really good teacher, they'll be even better. But a good curriculum in the hands of a, a teacher, they'll make it'll make them better. It's not a mission to stay, unfortunately. So. <laughs> but it's very interesting, right? It's very, very interesting. Good curriculum is really important. We didn't have any. We failed. Oh, we failed every time. It was so painful. So artists and teachers, you know, I love them, but in the end, Sister Rebecca is an artist and teacher. Absolutely an artist and teacher. I don't want to teaching three or four years too, but nonetheless, she just she got it. She knows how to do it. Yes, ma'am. Is there any work of using technology to connect different levels of students to teach one another? It's a good question. It's a good question. Um, we should be doing more of that, Inter intergenerational, for third graders, fifth graders. I mean, there is this peer instruction, actually, that Anne Marie was, was, was uh, pioneering in terms of reading, older kids helping younger kids read. Why don't we use the technology to do that? It's a great question. Uh, we're not doing it, but we should be done. It's a good point. So I'm getting how you do, you know, you know getting them at home. And it should be done. It should be done. Because it works. It does work. You know, older kids helping the younger kids read, for example. Ellie, you talked about 21st century skills, and uh, you can clearly see links between collaboration and teaching those 21st century skills. Just stepping back to this 20th century, just disciplinary domain knowledge skills, do you think collaboration, uh, what's, the, what's the difference in effect versus something like the tutoring systems? We see these students in this picture, you see. They're getting personalized learning, but not a tutor. Uh, sorry, but it's probably an intelligent tutor or adaptive type of media, yeah. something like that not a collaborative system with their peers. Is there a difference in the amount of 20th century skill or just uh, domain knowledge that the students are able to learn? Do you have to give up one for the other? Well, I think that's what, the, what we're finding in Singapore is that you don't have to give it. The knock against project-based learning is the kids don't learn the content. That's, the, that's, the, that's what they say. Oh, no, if the kids are going to engage with projects, then they're going to spend more time in the doing and they're not going to master the content. That's the usual argument. Now, in Singapore, they still do spread uh, spreadsheets. They do worksheets, not to the degree that they've done, but we're not seeing a drop in test scores. If we did, I wouldn't be there. They wouldn't, they wouldn't tolerate it. So, um, you know, are they getting the content from the worksheets, or are they getting it from the projects? Probably a little of both. And it would be nice to be able to tease out a little bit better where that content is coming from. But um, you know, this kind of model, they're certainly not getting skills. They're, they're not getting uh, collaboration skills. They're not getting project skills. They're answering questions. And they're learning how to get 7 out of 10 right so they can progress. But it, it, you're right. Where, where are the lines? Good question. OK. One last one. Yes, sir. Everyone's really obsessed with data. How do you measure 21st century skills and things like soft skills? That's the last question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. And we, we're looking at how, how do you understand, like, say, collaboration? Because we know the sessions, we know everybody who did their notes. We have the data. So I can tell who did what. So maybe there's a way to start teasing out, for example, looking at those data, who did what, and how do you assess the, the, the success of the collaboration? That's the next thing we got to do. But that ain't mine. I don't do that stuff. I'm, I have no idea, actually. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>